Fire Emblem Warriors Three Hopes has been out for just over a month now, and after pouring over 100 hours into the game, finishing nearly all routes, reading into the lore, reading most of the support conversations, and dissecting the gameplay, and speaking with my peers about this game's mechanics, I now feel comfortable in providing my honest review of the game. To state my credentials to those unfamiliar with my content, I am coming at this review with only Fire Emblem Warriors the first as my Warriors game experience, so don't expect any comparisons to older Warriors games on the gameplay front at least. In addition, I will be comparing this game to Three Houses often, but if you're unfamiliar with the original Fodland game, I'll try to make it as understandable as I can. And since the game is still new, I will be keeping this review mainly gameplay focused and character slash story spoiler free. While I have a lot to say about where they took the story and its characters, that is more appropriate for a video down the line when more people have played the game. And when I do reference the story or characters, I'll be using the most vague terms as possible. Additionally, most of the dialogue scenes in this review will be without context and not revealing any hidden surprise or character appearances. Three Hopes takes the gameplay mechanics of Three Houses, the monastery exploration, class customization, combat arts and battalions, and of course the units themselves, and repurposes them from a turn-based RPG into a warrior's hack and slash fest. While both genres are obviously insanely different, for the most part, the game succeeds at capturing similar feelings of satisfaction upon having a unit unleash their potential to the world. The other comparison worth making is Fire Emblem Warriors, the original, as they are based off the same engine, and it is very easy to compare the two. Three Hopes does differ in several things between the games though, here's a list of them for those curious. These are, in my opinion, the most significant ones between the three games that are most relevant for this gameplay review. Number 1. Battalions are significantly less important and gambits are not included in this game at all. Instead of stat buffs provided by the dining hall, kitchen buffs provide buffs for only 5 things. Starting warrior gauge, starting awakening gauge, warrior charge speed, awakening charge speed, and durability cost reduction. Number 3. Training points replace instructor points and on that note all classes except for fighter who can equip bows, axes, and gauntlets are locked to one weapon type. There are no exceptions to this, not even hybrid classes. They are only able to equip spells if they are meant to be hybrid. Number 4. Forging has aspects of both games. The difference between forging in either game is that in Fire Emblem Warriors, you couldn't forge preferred weapons the way you can just forge weapons in Three Hopes. In the first game, you had to complete a specific map which gave you that PRF's material. Weapons in Fire Emblem Warriors also had more attributes that needed to be unlocked with KOs, and you could actually transfer those attributes to other weapons. In Three Hopes, what you see is what you get with attributes, and they can't be transferred. Some similarities between Three Houses and Three Hopes is that you can reforge weapons into other weapons, like steel weapons into killer weapons. You have more orders to give AI in battle in Three Hopes compared to Fire Emblem Warriors, and combat arts and spells really add a lot of spice, fun, and depth to the gameplay. Number 6. The Crest System in Fire Emblem Warriors I know, confusing name in hindsight given the context, was your one-stop shop for all kinds of buffs. Attack, defense, and boost crests have been interestingly split apart for Three Hopes. Boost crests, which gave skills and weapon ranks, are handled by acquiring classes at the training grounds. Attack crests are now handled by higher tiered classes that give added normal attacks, and crests that affect warrior and awakening gauges are handled by the kitchen. And defensive crests that boost healing effects and warrior gauge count are given by the tactics instructor, with crests that reduce damage by different weapon types now delegated to battalions. I just gave the broad strokes and there's more to it than that, but you get the point. It's really cool to see how three houses handled the crest market and made it their own. Three Hopes is really a combination of Fire Emblem Warriors and Three Houses, and thankfully, it does retain the in-battle management of units of Fire Emblem Warriors alongside the unit customization of Three Houses 
pretty well. Just like in Three Houses, the feeling of creating an utterly destructive offensive force by constantly reclassing any given character to learn a combination of things like alert stances, darting blows, death blows, battalion vantages, and wraths, and so on, hits close to home in Three Hopes as well. And that is what I would say the strongest aspect of the unit customization is. In your normal playthroughs, especially when you really start to understand what sorts of learned abilities and combat arts and spells can stack well together, and finally having everything you want and unleashing that unit to the enemies is a genuinely great and satisfying feeling. The combat is legitimately a absolute blast. Breaking stun gauges, whittling down enemies, strategizing around bulky mounted and armor units with slayer weapons, or especially for this game, effective combat arts and spells is just so attention grabbing and engaging. Yeah, it is a mashy genre, I know, but it was a great design choice to give me more interactive and visually satisfying ways to defeat enemies. Combat arts and spells really distinguish the game from its predecessors in the gameplay department, and sequencing crazy hit combinations with arts and spells mixed in with normal and strong attacks, triggering a warrior special with a partner, and properly timing awakening mode is just straight up enjoyable. There's not much else to say after that. I wrote an entire video guide on this topic too, so if you want a better understanding of how that system works, give it a watch. But anyway, Three Hopes properly uses the customization of its base game and mostly translates it well to Three Hopes. In battle, commanding units, managing their actions while switching seamlessly to one of your four controllable allies feels really good. When you're appropriately leveled for normal and hard difficulties, everything felt very engaging for me. Commanding allies to seize a fortress, getting another ally to break a wall or push a boulder, going all out offensive or defensive to gang up on or protect someone all felt satisfying most of the time. The only thing that spoiled this experience was on hard or maddening mode when your units were not properly leveled. The issue became that since they were underleveled, they legitimately took forever to defeat an enemy commander or seize a fortress. It became less about delegations of tasks and more of sending a unit somewhere to just control them later, or at worst, using them to buy time for your strongest unit, Shez in my case, to run over there and finish the job. That's why I personally recommend normal on your first playthrough, and if you're up for the tedium of hard, that too I guess. The problem with hard in my opinion is that you might end up having a less fun, slower, and frustrating experience if any one of your core units aren't properly leveled up. Enemies are stronger and take more damage as difficulty raises, but your ally AI is still the same, meaning it takes longer for them to get the basic tasks finished. I played Scarlet Blaze first, and I will say the first playthrough left me engaged for most of the run. I was constantly planning out my mid to late game unit builds, and watching them hold their own in legitimately high stress story maps was really satisfying. I've said satisfying like four times here, but I really mean it. The game is at its best when you're keeping up with your core four to five unit team builds and abilities with the story missions. Besides leveling up, mastering classes, and combining learned class abilities, Abilities, there is quite a high importance on weapon forging in this game. I already mentioned how different forging was between Fire Emblem Warriors and this game, but working on your favorite weapon will likely be a playthrough long ordeal. Weapons can get up to plus 100. More forges essentially means more might for the weapon for damage and more weapon durability for combat arts and spells. On a new game playthrough, you are most likely going to keep forging and developing your weapons alongside your units, making the event eventual endgame builds all kind of come together. At least for me, that's what it felt like. On the topic of forging and unit progression, the camp. The area you'll be spending all of your time not in combat, fast traveling to the training instructor, grinding buffs and support points at the chore and kitchen master, is worth a brief mention here. For the most part, the camp is well thought out and in many quality of life aspects fixes a lot of annoying things that were in the monastery exploration segments in Three Houses, like fast traveling to specific units, it just straight up being a smaller area, and of course engine advancements making it faster to load stuff. 
all just works better for the camp. But I digress. I wanted to mention the blacksmith and armorer area because you will most likely never buy weapons in any run ever. You can just find so many higher quality weapons from maps and drops and stuff that this NPC feels like a complete afterthought and the most pointless shop in the game. And as for unit progression, battalions aren't really that interesting in this game, despite having an entire upgradable facility for it. Battalions don't serve much purpose outside of giving stun gauge buffs and reduced damage to certain weapon types. I really don't think it has any business being its own facility, and like the armorer, does sort of feel like an afterthought like they just had to throw something in and call back to three houses in some way. But other than that, a lot of these facilities felt like they had their place. With that all being said, your first new game playthrough should be an awesome experience. For me, everything was working properly, combined with the new stories to tell and legitimately fantastically written support conversations and intriguing paralogues putting these characters in new situations together was really, really fun. I really did have a genuinely memorable experience on my Scarlet Blaze playthrough. But sadly, because this is a three root game, you still have two of those to play, and in my opinion, it is on these successive playthroughs, New Game Plus, and a lack of any post game whatsoever that the cracks start to show and the gameplay's limitations get exposed. Here comes the criticism part of the gameplay. Three Hopes and Three Houses sharing an incredibly similar class customization system and Hopes focusing more on emulating Three Houses than it does having truly unique characters like Fire Emblem Warriors did does mean it misses out on things that the first succeeded really well at. What I mean by unique is that in Fire Emblem Warriors, units felt like they had a certain identity. They had certain skills, movesets, and stat caps that would all contribute to certain builds. While yes, some characters shared movesets, that didn't mean they were the same character altogether. Fire Emblem Warriors had a lot of moving parts going on that contributed to a unit's identity far more than just a moveset. Movement type, race, PRF, and normal weapon attributes, and the distribution of key build relevant stats like speed, skill, and luck all meant that different characters had different paths despite their shared movesets. Anna, Takumi, Niles, and Sakura did share a moveset, but endgame builds were catered towards their other properties. Stats mattered a lot more in Fire Emblem Warriors than it does in Three Hopes. Anna had stupidly high luck, which is legitimately one of the most important stats to have in the game, giving her the potential to use certain skills that, say, Niles wouldn't be as efficient for. Marth and Celica share the same moveset, but Celica has higher magic and can heal. In Three Hopes, things are so standardized that after you break the stat limit attribute, caps are all raised to 120. And yeah, while the casual player will likely not even notice this, when it comes to end game builds and max stat unit builds and stuff like that, is there really a huge noticeable difference between Linhart, Mercedes, and Manuela as healers, or Hubert, Lysithia, or Happy as Gremories and a Dark Bishop? When their most relevant offensive stats like magic, skill, speed, and luck, the latter ones which influence certain ability trigger chances are all capped at the same stat level, unique action abilities being transferable thanks to the mercenary whistle, and crest compatibility returning thanks to New Game Plus's Renown Shop also contribute to units losing their unique feel. But to be fair, there are definitely some units that are among the best in the game and do stick out thanks to their support abilities or inherent unique action abilities like Lauren's, Felix, Sylvain, and Ferdinand, who can afford to have a different accessory equipped than the Merc Whistle gift item because of their default kit, but they're the exceptions, not the norm. But at the end of the day, the lack of any post-game makes the pursuit of these endgame builds even less worth working for since there's no content to play where that's worth the trouble. And it's made worse by the fact that genre differences at least make houses feel less repetitive and bland than it could have been. Both games have the issue of too much customizability and not enough truly unique units. Upon repeat playthroughs of Three Houses, it's very possible that you can start to feel you're just building the same unit up in a different model with a different personal ability. Anyone can be almost anything and wield basically anything they want at any time, but it still worked for hundreds upon hundreds of hours, at least for me, seeing as I have over 800 hours in houses. Because of the genre-specific factors that could add to the playthrough 
playthrough experience like enemy placement, map objectives, turn-based combat, much more linear chapter and character progression, i.e. having limited auxiliary maps to grind XP, and last but not least, RNG, which could completely transform a gameplay experience with unexpected character growths, deaths, and the like. While Three Hopes has functionally different personal abilities in the form of unique action abilities, not many of them serve any greater purpose than to allow the player to mash A faster or do extra damage. You don't get things that are truly strategic, like Hilda's or Sylvain's or Felix's or Sedith's personal abilities in Three Houses that can completely turn the tides in an incredibly tight and stressful turn by just adding a tiny bit more damage to get a successful kill on an enemy. And so, because of the unique action abilities having mostly the same purpose, the fact that all endgame builds want to do the same thing of damage per second, and that there's literally less late game classes than in Three Houses, seriously, Hero was basically finished but scrapped last second, War Monks and War Clerics, Valkyries and Dark Flyers aren't even included in the base game while Trickster arbitrarily is, there are too few endgame options for a cast this big. Female units just aren't allowed to use gauntlets after passing intermediate classes, as fighter is the only one that a female can access that has gauntlets. Gender locked classes are another problem that I have with this game, and I still think War Master should not be locked to just males. Because RNG doesn't have that much of an impact to level ups, serves zero noticeable purpose in the maps themselves, and units start to overlap in similarity, my second and third playthroughs started to get legitimately boring, because I was essentially doing the same thing over and over again. Again, technically the same thing happens in three houses, but the aforementioned structural differences in genres really allows three houses to sustain its fun and uniqueness, in my opinion. I do have more to say about genre differences because I know it's easy to write off Warriors being a repetitive game by just saying it's the genre but I do have comments on that later in the video. Upon completion of a first playthrough, you unlock New Game Plus, Maddening Mode, and some New Game Plus exclusive units to play as depending on the ending you landed on. New Game Plus is, to be honest, not that impressive, barring that the Vanguard Whistle bypasses the worst part of the campaign, the obligatory auxiliary maps. It's an item that lets you skip boring content to get to the story you have yet to see. What's exceedingly disappointing are the New Game Plus units you unlock. With the exception of one unit, you cannot use them in the campaign. They can only be deployed at the Record Keeper. This was an utterly baffling and pointless decision on the developers. Just let me frickin use these New Game Plus units in these story missions. Literally, who cares about suspension of disbelief or balance at this point? I'm already playing New Game Plus, and balance has already been thrown out the window. Maddening mode is just harder than hard mode, and worst of all, there's no post-game content to speak of like I mentioned before. Once you complete all three routes, there's actually nothing left to do. To compare this game with past Nintendo licensed Warriors games, Fire Emblem Warriors had history mode which was updated with new DLC maps when new characters got revealed. Hyrule Warriors got adventure mode. This game has absolutely nothing right now. While yes, you are supposed to play two more routes after your first one, this isn't post-game content. It's just content the player chose not to play yet. And before anyone comes to the game's defense and blame the Warriors genre for being inherently repetitive, that it may not be the right gameplay genre for me, and or if someone asks the question, what did you expect, to this I respond, Yes, technically you are right in that it's a hack and slash, push the A button mash fest of a genre, that doesn't mean that it's destined to suffer these problems. There are definitely things Three Hopes could have done to have a longer lasting impact. This is kind of a personal gripe that I have, so take this with a grain of salt, but the assets for Fire Emblem Warriors are like right there, are they not? I wouldn't mind them semi-recycling Fire Emblem Warriors classes in some capacity for the sake of some class diversity. Sword and Mage Cavaliers, Lance Infantry, that kind of thing. It's sort of baffling to me that they committed so closely to Three Houses' class and unit progression system while cutting corners in its translation from a turn-based strategy game to a hack and slash. Of course, I'm not getting into the story or the supports, but let's just say that those, alongside the lack of post-game and annoyingly lacking advanced and master classes, just 
missing for no reason, it all sort of makes the game feel like it wasn't quite ready for release, despite a lot of enjoyable, playable content being right there. I know I just contrasted my praise for the game's class system and actual in-the-moment gameplay with complaints about the very same thing, but that's just because I honestly think that this game in its current state is a mixed bag of mostly positive things with unignorable negatives. It has a really, really strong start, and if it were judged on one playthrough, this review would be a lot more universally positive. But it does have those problems within its strongest mechanical praises. The likeness to Three Houses' unit management is solid and impressively retooled into a Warriors game, can't deny that. But the genre differences that make Three Houses more sustainable and replayable as a turn-based RPG is something that Three Hopes in its current state could have worked harder to emulate better. Would I recommend this game to purchase fully priced? I still poured over 100 hours and mostly enjoyed my time streaming the game and playing the main story missions, and my first new game playthrough was quite memorable, and everyone who I've spoken with, especially on their first playthrough or their second playthrough if they're playing new game, still seems to enjoy their run. Again, this is all my opinion. If you're unfamiliar with Warriors games and are only interested in the story and characters of Fodlin in this new retelling of the story, I think you can probably get away with watching LPs and story cutscene and support compilations on YouTube, while of course also being subscribed to my channel for awesome lore videos about the world of Fodlin and its characters. But if you liked Fire Emblem Warriors and Three Houses, I think this is a worthwhile purchase despite its flaws. At the end of the day, I do not regret buying this game. If you're not ready to buy this game yet but you like how it looks and plays, maybe wait for it to go on sale. How's it going everyone? Off script Gast here. Just want to say thank you so much for watching this video. Like I said, this is all my opinion and your mileage with the game may vary. I just want to give a huge thank you to everyone who has recently subscribed to the channel. The channel has passed 97,000 and is decently on its way to 98,000. And of course, if you've been paying attention to the channel or you've been watching my content, you know that the big, 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 big goal is 100,000 subscribers. So if you are watching right now, but you haven't subscribed yet, and if you're curious about people's opinions on Three Hopes and you saw mine and you're watching this and you liked it, it would really mean a lot if you decided to hit subscribe and support the channel that way. If you want to also support the channel, you can leave a like and comment down below your thoughts on Three Hopes as well. Just make sure it's spoiler free because this is a spoiler free review. And yeah, that's pretty much all there is. Catch you in the next one. Deuces.